when your kid's education is at stake, then you say, okay, how do we solve this problem? If they don't get education, then they are going to fall behind, which is a problem. There are kids that just have not figured out how to sit in front of a computer. Keeping up in the classroom just got more difficult. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jessica Aguirre. Summer is over, but the coronavirus pandemic is not. And a summer surge in COVID cases means the majority of Bay Area school kids will not be headed back into the classroom this month. Now, for the next half hour, we're going to take a deeper look at the issues facing kids, parents, and teachers, the impact on grades and their mental health, and the technology needs. And really, the biggie in this? Safety. Whose life is at risk if we head back into the classroom? We'll also be answering some of your questions. Now, back in March, when schools shut down due to COVID-19, the thought was that California's almost 6 million K-12 through kids would be back in the classroom in just a matter of weeks. That didn't happen, and the spring semester was a total bust. And now, we're facing the start of what could be a fall fail. There's a normal rhythm to August. Last of summer vacation makes way for new backpacks, spiffy new school clothes, and the coming return to the classroom. Okay, Michaela, but this pandemic has created a new kind of August. This school year, for all intents and purposes, again, is over. That was Governor Newsom back in April. But the closure of schools now stretching into the new school year. This side of the color wheel often represents. That means for the foreseeable future, living rooms will serve as classrooms and teachers will visit students over a computer screen. This is going to be a really pivotal moment for education. Hola Edgar, soy Miss Ramos. Yo voy a ser tu maestra, okay? Another face of our new reality in Hayward, where year-round students recently met their teachers in a school drive-by. I cannot see they hug the kids. That's very hard for me. I got a lot of kids. <laughs> These strange times have parents looking for creative solutions. Some trying to form education pods with parents and hired tutors to do the teaching. We really are, you know, building the plane as we're flying it right now as parents. How we respond as humanity to this challenge is what's going to define us. You can click into here to see the learning objectives. At the same time, there are fears that the financial divide will create an educational divide. Another question for an August like no other. It's going to be a challenge, that's for sure. Now, the school year starts for lots of kids next week, and it's rife with complexities. Think about this. Our nine Bay Area counties have 154 school districts. We're talking over a million kids, and that's just K through 12. It doesn't include kids in private schools or kids in college. Another issue, 22% of low-income households with school kids in California have no Internet access. So... How does the state plan to pull off this feat? And how different will the fall be from the spring? And are we ever getting back into the classroom? Joining me now is Linda Darling-Hammond. She's president of the California State Board of Education. Linda, thank you so much for being with us. First off. My pleasure. I don't know any parent who thought that spring was great. It was an epic failure at my house. But the legislature <laughs> did establish some minimum requirements for the school year coming in, and it is tied to funding. So walk us through what we're going to see different now. Well, I think we'll see a lot of things that are different. As you said, the legislature has set a minimum instructional day that everyone will experience. Every student should have synchronous instruction uh, with the teacher for some part of that day. Uh, there's been a lot of professional development, so teachers have a lot more uh, readiness to teach in an online context for those districts that will be online. And we've done a lot to get computers and hotspots um, lined up for students who didn't have them in the spring. So we've had a lot of contributions from people like from corporations like Google, uh, Apple, and T-Mobile have just pledged another million iPads that have connectivity, which will almost finish closing the digital divide that we were experiencing in the spring. Uh, and districts have about $5 billion coming from the state and federal money, uh, both for technology supports and for instructional supports to close the learning loss gap mm -hmm. that may have occurred thus far. So when you say synchronous instruction, is that face-to-face -face instruction with the kids so that they see each other either through Zoom or something? Because that's really that's, right. that's really critical for students, right? 
Absolutely. You need to see each other, you know, both in the classroom with the teacher and now in the Zoom breakout rooms with your small groups. Uh, sometimes that will also mean a paraprofessional who can work with special needs students one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one or in small groups as well. So that is, that is the foundation. And then on top of that, you can build project work and a variety of other activities that kids are engaged in. Uh, that help them really, you know, continue to grow and learn. So in my district, we just got our bell schedule for my daughter, and it basically has her going from 8.30 in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon into each classroom via the computer. Is that what most schools are doing, or is it really up to in the individual district to decide how much actual class time mm -hmm. the kids get? Yeah, it is different from class to class and from grade level to grade level. Um, I would assume your daughter is a little bit older because that would be a little harder for younger children, but there are uh, schedules in every district. They have some time that's in the Zoom and some time that is, you know, usually some time out of the Zoom where kids are also doing some physical activity, um, finishing some activities that may be in a, another computer program or in textbooks or in written work that they're completing as well. Now, other countries have brought kids back into the classroom with, you know, some <clears throat> have done better than others. Um, so uh, are we looking at those models to see if we're ever going to go back into the classroom? Are we looking at what other countries are doing, the ones that have been successful and the ones that haven't? Absolutely. We're looking at both of those. There are, you know, a dozen or two dozen countries that have in various ways brought kids back to school. There are a lot of countries that have not yet done that. Those that have been successful. Uh, have really guided the guidance that we've put out, which includes, you know, face coverings and physical distancing and uh, small cohorts and other things that you'll see when the kids do get back to school. And it will happen. It's just going to take a little bit longer, particularly in the Bay Area where we have so many people. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of incentive to follow the rules when people see that kids can't get back to school unless they're also wearing their face masks right. and staying socially distanced. New York was in a very bad way some months ago, you probably remember, uh, and many of their districts are now going back to school because they have you know, brought the curve back down, and I'm confident that we'll be able to do that as well. So let's talk about mental health versus that learning loss. You know, a lot of parents are concerned that kids lost so much ground uh, last semester, and they want the kids to go back to school, but at the same time, there's the health risk, right? And if they don't go back to school, then there's the mental health risk. It's almost like we're between a rock and a hard place here. Well, it is true that being together in person is a wonderful thing for human beings. We are social creatures. It is also true that while we are online, teachers are prepared. Almost every district has a social and emotional curriculum as well. They're going to start the year figuring out how to build that community, how to find out what's been going on with the kids, what they need, make sure that they're getting that, you know, kind of um, mental health support. Uh, and social and emotional support that they need right alongside of the academics. That's a big priority for us. So a lot of schools, uh, some schools, they're applying for elementary schools for waivers from the California Department mm -hmm. of Health to do that in-person instruction. California Teachers Association is opposed to it. I wanted to get your thoughts. Well, it will only be approved in the cases where it is sufficiently safe. And uh, we know that, first of all, it can be uh, more easily managed, these small cohorts with physical distancing in elementary schools, in big counties. Sometimes you have areas of the county that are also, um, you know, further removed from the places where the infection rates are highest. So county mental health departments or county public health departments, along with uh, school superintendents, will figure out where it is safe to open elementary schools and to do it in ways that um, have all of the safety features associated with them. Well, finally tonight, my daughter is a senior, so is it even realistic to think that she's going to have any school year? Do you think this is going to go past January and is the whole year going to be a bust or do you believe we will be at some point back in class? I think it's quite possible that many, many schools, many districts will open at some point in the year. Some of them are waiting right now to see if they will get off of the county monitoring mm -hmm. list. And uh, others are saying, well, we're going to do distance learning this semester and we're hoping to be back in person next semester. It really depends on all of us in the public following the rules, socially distancing, wearing our face masks, 
so that we can you know, be safe, bring the rates down, and get the kids back to school. Yeah, being prudent could yield some results. Linda, thank you so much for your expertise. We always appreciate um, hearing from you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Well, pulling double duty, what happens when you're both a teacher and a parent? We're talking to two teachers on opposite sides of the bay about the challenges of remote learning and their advice for trying to keep kids engaged. Then we asked and you answered. Parents, teachers, and students share their thoughts and biggest concerns about the upcoming school year. We'll share the results of our back to school survey. That's next. I'm Jonathan Bloom. Keeping up in the classroom is taking on a whole new dimension for some students in Marin. One school is taking the classroom outdoors. It's kind of like school, but better. This has never been done before. We're making history, and it's an honor in, in a weird way. Students will not only learn reading, writing, and math, but also nature. The kids love it, but some parents have concerns. You can watch my full story online with the QR code at the bottom of your screen. Use your phone camera to scan it, and it'll take you right to my story. Well, welcome back to Keeping Up in the Classroom. Now, one of the big questions nagging at parents and teachers is how many hours of classroom learning did kids really lose? Okay, we did the math for you based on the schedule for San Francisco Unified School District. Let's start with last spring. School shut down mid March, which means students missed. 55 days of in school learning. You multiply that by five hours a day. They weren't in class. They weren't in class then, and that's, that doesn't count lunch or recess. That means students missed 275 hours of classroom learning. Let's look forward. If schools don't go back to in person learning until January, kids would miss 80 days, five hours a day again. Remember, no lunch. That's 400 hours. If you add that all together, students could be missing up to 135 days of in classroom learning, a total of 675 hours. Now, think about this a regular school year has 180 days of instruction. So, spending 135 days outside the classroom, that's two thirds of the school year. You can see why people are so fired up. Now, all this week, we've been asking teachers, parents, and students to share their own questions and their concerns through our back to school survey. Chris Kimmer has been looking through the results for us, and what are parents saying, Chris? Uh, it's all over the map, Jess, both geographically and metaphorically. First, thank you to the people who participated. Let's look at what some people shared. Let's start with Robin in San Jose. She says she's a teacher, and she posted this. There isn't anything the school districts can do to make us feel safe. I know that even with the temperature checks, we will be exposed. I won't feel safe until there's a vaccine. Many people offered up recommendations. Here's what Michael, a Parent in Los Gatos suggests, he said, it's kind of like that story that Jonathan Blim's talking about, have classes outdoors, small groups when necessary, do online lectures college style with small seminars in person. Jason Williams, a San Jose parent, wrote us this. He said kids need to be in school. The district could have postponed the start of the year by eliminating vacation days. An anonymous comment from a person who only identified themselves as a teacher in Tracy said there are no good choices. Just a set of poor ones. And boy, that is a bottom line right there. Let's take a look at some of the numbers real quick here, centered around two thorny questions. First, we asked, do you feel safe either going back to school or sending your kids back to school? Parents and teachers are split here. Look at this. Parents, 45, 55, yeah, right down the middle basically. But teachers, look at that. 94% of in our survey said no, they don't feel safe going back. 6% said yes. We also gauge people's confidence in online education. We asked, how effective was virtual learning? We have another parent teacher split right here. You can see it mapped out. The red is where people don't have confidence, and the green is where they do. Teachers at the top, parents at the bottom. You can see there that we have parents who are way more likely to believe that it is not effective than teachers. Jess, I understand you're going to talk to some teachers right now. Is that right? Yeah, we are actually. And we'll, we'll ask him to see if they concur with what. What other people are saying. We do hope that distance learning will be better this fall. And teachers have spent the summer, as you heard, gearing up for remote instruction that they hope mimics what they saw in the classroom. But teachers are starting this school year with their own fears and their own trepidations, as you've been hearing, Chris. Joining me now is Sylvianne Cohn. She's a third grade teacher at Joaquin Elementary School in Oakland. And Jody Parks Desario, she's a drama and English teacher at Willow Glen High in San Jose. Thank you, ladies, for being with us. Jody, I want to start with you. You know, we've been talking about how hard it's been for parents and kids, but this has been really hard on teachers like yourself because you guys have had to do double duty yourselves with your own kids. 
Right. Yeah, that's been a challenge to have two kids in the district go through the the uh, crisis learning in the spring. And uh, now I my eighth grader is still uh, in the school district. Yeah, that's really, really tough. Sylvie, let's bring you in. You're headed back to that virtual classroom on Monday. What's your biggest concern? I think a couple of major concerns. First of all, I'm really worried about the mental health of my students and their well-being. That's something I'm really looking forward to tackling. And I'm also just really concerned about the uncertainty that this year has. So what's your plan for making it engaging and making the students want to be on and connecting with you? I found in the spring that the most effective method was just making sure that we maintained um, connection with our students after we left the physical building. So the more time that we could spend actually having class meetings and um, having small group instruction and talking to them, um, making sure they really felt like part of a community still, that really worked for the teachers at my school best. And also the teachers found that if they collaborated in grade level circuits, then that was also really effective in sharing the load and sharing great ideas. Now the thing is so like that before, everyone could benefit. So last semester you already had a connection with your students because you'd been working with them, but now you're starting with a whole new crop of students, correct? Yes. So that whole in-person thing so in those first couple of weeks is difficult. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, which is I think why that is such a priority for teachers right now. Um, they really want to make sure that their kids feel safe within whatever academic environment we can create online. And we want to make sure that they um, are able to learn. Uh, and they're not going to be able to learn if they don't feel that sense of belonging right. and that sense of safety in the classroom. Yeah, and so that, that's going to be a major focus for the first Yeah, several that weeks. connection. Jody, let's bring you in. You work for San Jose Unified, mm -hmm. and uh, they want their teachers to go back into the empty classrooms to create a uniform platform, but you're not really on board for that. I know you filed an exemption, and I know you've been saying that you feel yeah. tired, disrespected, devalued teachers as a whole. Um, so how do you feel about going back into the classroom? Clearly you don't want to do that. Yeah, I think there's there's still a lot of safety issues that, you know, definitely things have been minimized by having the kids go full distance learning, but by putting 85 teachers on campus along with another 30 support staff and their kids, we now have a whole lot of people sharing restrooms and going into the office to make photocopies and get our mail. It's it's still very unsafe. So did you get the exemption? Does that mean that you're going to be working from home? I did. And I know there's some contract issues also with not just your district but others because this whole you know setup is not what you guys have normally done. No, it's you know it's been different for everyone the whole time. We've all been learning on the go. Um, but I think that actually gives us a little bit more connection with the kids because this was all out of the blue and new to them. So they're learning as they go too. So we kind of, we, we get each other. Okay, at any point, are you willing to go back into the classroom? Do you think it's gonna be safe at all this school year? Or do you think that this entire year, and I'm gonna ask Sylvie the same question as well, that this entire school year should be, sent, should be spent doing remote learning? You know, I'm hopeful that things are different health and safety wise and that we can get back. We all want to be back in the classroom with our kids. We miss them as much as they miss us or at least miss their friends. Um, but you know, if something major doesn't change uh, health wise, no, I don't think I am comfortable going back. And you, Sylvie? Pretty much the same thing. Um, we absolutely want to be in the classroom <laughs> as much as anyone does. We really miss the kids. We miss the direct interaction with them. We all agree that Zoom is not the same thing. But at the same time, um, lives are really on the line when we enter the building. Yeah. And m pretty much all of the teachers I've talked to are very aware of the very real risk that that poses. Well, we both hope that we we, st we hope that you both stay safe and healthy, and we certainly thank you for all you do. We know that teaching really is a labor of love, and we appreciate um, the efforts that you make for our kids. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Well, up next, parenting in the era of this pandemic, what moms and dads are doing to help their kids keep up in the classroom and why so many of us are struggling doing it. And interested in going beyond our special? Well, we have a full section online devoted to all things that have to do with education. Super easy. Go to NBCBarrier.com, click on Keeping Up in the Classroom, right at the top of the page. We're looking at the negative impact this pandemic is having on colleges, among other things. More with us after the break. Welcome back. The digital divide is certainly not anything new, but that gap between those with access and those without has certainly been widened by COVID. Now, researchers from Brown and Harvard University looked at over 800 students with a math program called ZERN, and the students were tested before and after schools closed. Check out what we learned. In low-income households, students found that they got less learning, low-income students, 50% less learning when doing distance learning. If you look at medium-income households, the learning, 33% less learning. However, if you look in high-income households, kids learned 0% less, meaning they kept up just fine. Now, regardless of income, having a kid in school right now is worrisome, it's frustrating, and it's difficult to navigate. Parenting during the pandemic, problematic for sure. Joining me now is Amy Longinetti. Amy was a teacher, but she's taking a break this year to focus on her own kids. Amy, thank you for being with us. I know you recently thank just you. made this decision not to go back, and now you're going to be in the same boat as the rest of us, but you have a little bit of an advantage over the rest of us. Yes, yes, I do. So, um, it, go ahead. No, how are you going to handle it? So, you know, it just... It was a combination of what the ladies were talking about before. Um, I just was not sure that there was any point this year that I was going to feel safe being in the classroom mm -hmm. and being another vector of exposure to my family. Um, and so that combined with the fact that, um, you know, kids definitely, even if they can navigate electronically and get in and out, they definitely need a little more support for when they aren't understanding things. Um, there's just... There's no replacement for in-person learning. Um, and I wanted to be able to take this time, and thankfully we're in a position that I can take this time um, to be there for my kids and a couple of my friends who um, are work from home full time. So I'm gonna have a few friends at the house as well helping out. And uh, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna be the teacher with the ruler walking around telling them to focus on their classes. Okay, everyone wants to be your friend now because we wanna send our kids to you because that's gonna be fantastic. Right? So what's your biggest yeah. concern with your own kids and those that your students that you had before about not being in school? Are you more worried about their academic readiness or are you more worried about their mental health? You know, I have a really different point of view being a teacher. I've taught both high school, junior high, and early school or early, you know, childhood education with, with preschool. And so for me, the primary concern is my kids' social emotional growth and well being, especially I have a daughter who's gonna be thirteen next month, mm. you know, so that that gets a little bit more dicey the older they get. Um, and so that's my primary concern and my primary focus for them. Any learning gaps, because of my background, I'm able to fill in and make up. Um, so that's not a huge concern for me. Uh, but staying on track, certainly. My son's in a two-way bilingual immersion program for Spanish, and that's not something I can replicate. So, um, you know, they need to keep up with that. My daughter's going to be in high school soon. Right. Um, and we've actually switched her over to a private school because... Um, something you mentioned just before I came on about the income difference. And I think a huge part of that study would probably, if you looked further, is the fact that the kids in the higher incomes are in private schools. And the kids that were in private schools this spring had direct instruction all the time. Right. They didn't skip a beat compared to the public schools. And some of my son's friends had like zero contact with some of their teachers. And that just can't happen. These kids need connection for multiple reasons. Very quickly, I'm at a loss with the homeschooling. I'm just not really good at it. What advice can you give parents like me and others out there about navigating this? Uh, provide a lot of grace for yourself and your children. <laughs> um, this is such a small, hopefully going to be such a small snapshot of our world. If they stay on top with their math and their reading and their writing, 
everything else can probably be, you know, made up in the long term. But, you thank know, you. keep on task with the math and the reading especially. All right. Thank you, Amy, very much. Okay. Before we go. Thank we, you. Thank you. We want to turn to your questions, your concerns. Chris Camaro's back. Okay. What you got on that back to school survey? All right. So Sal's comment here, I want to start off with really just taps into what we've been talking about past 30 minutes or so here. He says, my children need in-person interaction with others. Their mental wellness concerns me as well as regular physical and the regular health, right? So medical health. All right, Michelle writes, I do not think schools should reopen until offices do, and they should follow the same guidelines. We've heard many concerns along those lines and with regard to child care resources as well. An anonymous kindergarten teacher wrote us about schools. She said schools must hire additional custodians, she said, custodians who will actually clean the rooms. Many people in our survey conveyed a sense of unease, and that tracks with a national survey with the consulting firm Deloitte. It recently conducted that with 1,200 people and found that 66% of people do feel some form of anxiety this school year. So if you're feeling anxious, you are not alone. Jessica, back over to you. I am feeling anxious. You're right, Chris. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is a lot for all of us to take in, and I certainly hope that we've given you some insight and some measure of comfort that we really all are learning this together. And like they say, never stop learning because life never stops teaching. And 2020 will certainly go down as a year filled with some very hard lessons for all of us. We hope you enjoyed our special. Thanks for being with us. Good night and stay healthy.